Samson has to be the most bizarre story in the Bible. Beating out Jonah and the big fish, and even Balaam's talking donkey, hands down. Samson was a man who, yes, was empowered with this great superhuman strength, where he he could kill a thousand Philistines in one battle with the jawbone of a donkey. Now that sounds pretty, pretty amazing to do with this uh, ancient instrument, a, a weapon, but it was a fairly common weapon at the time, so I guess that's not all that unusual. But certainly a thousand people is. But that's just really the, the top, the surface level of the crazy that went on here. I mean, this guy, his adventures included capturing 300 foxes. Now, that in itself is pretty amazing. You know, did he throw a net, a blanket? I mean, how does he grab 300 and then corral them and and manage them and then tie them up? He must have applied some kind of uh, of resin or tar to their tails because then after tying them up and releasing them into the fields of the Philistines, he sets the tails on fire for this improvised weapon of mass destruction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Samson is an army of one, unstoppable. A lion comes to attack him? Oh, I don't think so. He rips him apart like he's a goat. No problem for Samson. Yes, he was um, unbindable, uncapturable, except for women. I know, three women to be exact, but before we get into that funner part of the story, we have to keep in mind the whole time that that Samson is God's chosen judge. Now, a judge was kind of a military pastor, okay? He was to lead the people, to save them from their enemies, but lead them back to faithfulness and goodness and fidelity to the God who had called them out of slavery. That's the judge. And for Samson, it wasn't a job that was just forced on him, like poor Gideon. You know, he's just hiding out. You know, it's, oh man, okay. And, and it wasn't like Deborah, who's like, well, you know, since there aren't any guys around, they're going to stand up and do it. Okay. No, Samson was somebody who had the angel of the Lord come to his parents and announce his birth and then set him aside with a special vow, a Nazarite vow. Now, don't cut his hair, don't let him drink any alcohol, and I will be with him. You think about it, there's a very elite group of people that had an angel announce their birth. Isaac, Old Testament. you got to jump all the way to the New Testament with John the Baptist and then Jesus. I mean, you're really something special to have an angel and then the angel of the Lord. And he was, and he was going to do amazing things, but for some reason, the man, Samson, seemed to be completely clueless about the presence and the power and the intimate closeness of God who was with him, and that he pretty much lived his life however he just felt like living it, from passion to passion, and, and he was led by those passions more the time than his God. Case in point... His very first relationship, he goes into the enemy territory of Timnah, and he sees a Philistine woman, and that's the one for me. He tells his parents, get her for me for a wife, and he will not listen to their objections. No, no, she's the right one for me. It's like he's been on eHarmony.com, you know, he's found his soulmate, you know, this is going to go the distance, but it didn't. And this failed first marriage, with all of its domestic violence, it it was really a declaration of war of the Philistines against this army of one named Samson. Relationship, if you can call it that, number two with a woman. Now, there's really no delicate way to say this, other than just to read the text in the Bible. And it says that Samson went to be with a prostitute. For the normal reasons that one would go there. And you got to think, what? There's no commentary in the Bible that says, and that was bad. There, there was nothing in there that says, well, he shouldn't have. I mean, imagine St. Paul in that context. Or any one of the disciples. You know, but no, for Samson, he just went and was with a prostitute. Okay, keep that piece of information because it's really important for Samson's story. 
Now, while he's there, the men of Gaza, the Philistines, are like, well, we got him this time. We'll, we'll wait and ambush him in the morning when he's heading to home. And, well, Samson's done with his visit about midnight, and, and he's leaving and perhaps catches wind of the uh, ambush. And in a total gesture of bravado and, and, a, and a defiance of all of his enemies, he went down to the, to the wall of the city where the gate is. Now, the purpose militarily for a wall is to keep out the invaders, the, the robbers, all the bad people, right? So, so uh, Samson takes the gate of the city and just rips it off its hinges, its doorposts and everything, climbs up the city hill, and if they had a water tower, he would have climbed that too, and plants it right there, as if to declare to everybody, you can't touch this, all right? And, and they couldn't, and it was driving them crazy. What are we going to do? Relationship number three with a woman. You know her name. You heard a little bit about her. It's Delilah. And for those of you that are counting, this is relationship number three, but wife number two. And since she was a Philistine, you know, they kind of had an in here. Wait a minute, we have a chance to get Samson. And so they go and they offer a lot of money. And it says, will you just get his secret? Figure out what we can do. Find his kryptonite. You know, okay. And, and if you don't, we'll kill you. Okay. And so she's motivated. And she's working all of her ploys as a woman to get him to tell the secrets. And, and he's just playing with her at this point. He gives her three wrong answers. But then, for some reason, she just keeps nagging him, and it just keeps nagging him, and for no other reason than it seems than he just got tired of it, he told her the real answer. Tragically, Samson goes from passion to passion, from foolishness to immorality, from weakness to weakness. And there with his hair shorn, his vow broken with God, He's no longer an army of one, a ninja or an avenger. He's just one. And he's easily captured by the Philistines, his, his body bound by chains, his eyes gouged out and helpless. He becomes an object of their amusement. I mean, think of it. The guy who terrorized them, they couldn't touch, and now he's at the end of their chain. And they drag him into their temple of their God. They're going to hold a big celebration. Because to every Philistine, they knew that their God had just beat Samson's God. Now there, in the temple of the Philistines, archaeologists today have discovered, as they've excavated those, those remains and those ruins... That at that time, and, and those particular people, they built their temples so that they had in the center of the room these two round foundational stones about three feet apart, on which these large cedar timbers or pillars would then support the entire roof. Samson is placed at that very spot. And though he is absolutely helpless and pathetic, blinded, he prays to the God of Israel, the God who had given him his strength for one last opportunity to be the judge he is. And as he presses against those columns, they come down, and Samson kills more Philistines in his death than he does in his life. And the story of God continues to the next chapter of salvation. It's like, wow! You know, when you get to the end of that story, it's just like, why was that in the Bible? You know, if you were telling your own family story, wouldn't that be the uncle you kind of left out? <laughs> you know, and, and if you did tell his story, wouldn't you kind of keep, you kind of gloss over some of the more earthy details, right? But the Bible doesn't. It just gives everything right there, every ugly detail. Why? Well, Samson obviously is not an example of faith in that, you know, he was reckless, he was foolish, he was immoral. And there was no, um, at least in the text, no recognizable day-to-day -day acknowledgement of God, a dependence on Him, a humility of heart where he depended on God for each decision, each word, everything that he would do. There was no sense of, of righteousness and faithfulness in him that he could lead the people back to fidelity with God. 
And so he's not like, be like Samson. No. The reason his story is included is that his life is a mirror of the people of his day in Israel. Like Samson, they too had been called out from birth. They had been chosen by God and set apart with a vow. I will be your God, you will be my people. And God was with them powerfully to save them, to lead them in holiness and goodness and rightness. But like Samson, who just so casually visited a prostitute, so the people of that day just so casually opened up their hearts and their minds to all the other gods around them, and they worshipped them. As we read the story and as we hear it even today, you're really left with a sense, any honest reader is left with a sense that, you know, it just didn't have to be this way, right? I mean, they had God with them. He had all the strength. They had all of the faithfulness of their God. It just didn't have to be that way. And as we kind of step back from the text and go, well, we would not have been like that, at at least watch the news and realize our times are no less bizarre. We are no less immoral. We are no less prone just to do what we want to do because we feel like doing it. We are people who have the presence and the power of God with us, and yet we don't daily and regularly rely upon that presence for the words that come out of our mouth for the anger and the the attitude that comes out, for the decisions that we make, for how we treat one another. It's as if God were not there, but our heart is open to whatever anyone else says how to live life. Oh, well, this sounds good, or, or that sounds good. So you and I, we've been chosen by God. We've been set apart by God with a vow. You will be my people, and I will be yours. We've had somebody better than a judge come and fight for us. But Jesus goes into the temple of Satan and he stands not between two pillars of wood, but he's on the wood, nailed there. But he topples that temple of Satan with his death, crushing and even death itself. And our sins are all now answered for. And as Jesus has risen from the dead, we have been given a new birth. The angel of the Lord, Christ himself, has declared in our baptism that you're mine. And I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I and the Father, we come and we make our home with you. Your very body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God is present. As we find and look at our own story we realize, well, it just doesn't have to be that way. Not for us. Our eyes don't have to be blinded with our tears and our body bound by our our sinful consequences of our sins, but our eyes can be open to Christ. He's here. And our hands can be actively about the work, the good works that He has prepared in advance for us to do in Christ Jesus. Our lives can be daily dependent upon Him because He's here. There's a relationship of love and mutual, mutual love. Samson's story is for this very reason. It just doesn't have to be this way. And the good news of Christ is he's here to change all of us. So in his name then we pray and we say, Amen. We confess our faith then with these words of the Nicene Creed. I invite you to please stand.